Welcome to the Past Test Nephrology for MRC-PCH Part 1 lecture. This is Lecture 1 on Nephritis and Nephrosis. I'm Dr Nick Plant, one of the consultant paediatric nephrologists at the Children's Hospital in Manchester. First of all, we're going to run through the learning objectives for this lecture. Firstly, we're going to understand the common causes of nephritis and appreciate the underlying physiology. Then we're going to identify the key features of each common form of nephritis and how they differ from one another. We're going to learn the complement abnormalities associated with nephritis. Then we're going to move on to look at nephrotic syndrome. And then we're going to understand steroid-sensitive nephrotic syndrome and appreciate the underlying physiology. And finally, become familiar with the differences between nephritic and nephrotic states. Let's start off with a question. Question one. Regarding nephritis, are the following statements true or false? A. Proteinuria is diagnostic. B. Often follows staphylococcal infections. C. Hypokalemia is common and can induce arrhythmias. D. Hypertension is common. And E. Polyuria is often found early in the disease. So let's have a look at the answers. A. Proteinuria is diagnostic. This is false. In paediatric nephrology, proteinuria is virtually never diagnostic of any condition. It's a very early response to glomerular injury, non-specific response and not diagnostic in any way. So proteinuria is diagnostic is false. B, often follows staphylococcal infections. That's a classic example of a question where one thing has been replaced with another. It should be streptococcal infections, but they've put staphylococcal in, so the answer's false. C, hypokalemia is common and can induce arrhythmias. This is also false. The abnormality of potassium that you sometimes see is hyperkalemia. So although hypokalemia can induce arrhythmias, the answer is false because we commonly see hyperkalemia. D, hypertension is common. This is true. Hypertension is an almost inevitable part of nephritis, and we'll discuss the pathophysiology of that shortly. Finally, E, polyuria is often found early in the disease. That's also false. Oliguria is found early in the disease, and only later, when the renal function improves, do patients sometimes become polyuric. So polyuria is found late in the disease and not early, and therefore E is false also. Let's just review the basic principles behind nephritis. This is important for us to understand the clinical features that this syndrome exhibits. Nephritis is all about glomerular injury, and therefore the GFR falls, the creatinine rises, and the patient becomes oliguric. As a consequence of voiding less, they experience fluid overload, and as such get things like hypertension, mild edema, raised JVP, hepatomegaly, and we mustn't forget that with nephritis, the main thing is, is that these patients are hypervolemic. Their edema is mild because it's largely hydrostatic, and what we see is a patient who's often hypertensive who's got a really full circulation. They do get proteinuria because there's been injury to the glomerulus, but this is mild to moderate. It's not heavy, and subsequently the edema that they experience in nephritis is only mild. In nephritis, the urine's very active, and by that I mean it's full of white cells, it's full of red cells, it's full of casts. There are lots of elements in the urine. And if we can try and keep these features in our mind, we'll be able to contrast them very starkly to the basic findings in nephrosis as we move on through the lecture. So with that in mind, let's think now about the most common childhood glomerulonephritis post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. And this is a good example of a child who exhibits typical clinical features of nephritis. Post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis is seen at any age. However, it's commonest in the young school years, the ages between 5 and 9. It's commoner in males than females with a sex ratio of 2 to 1. And the etiology of the disease is that it's a primary glomerulonephritis with immune complex deposition related to Lansfield Group A beta hemolytic streptococci. And this illustration shows on a Petri dish beta hemolysis produced by streptococci. The etiology of post-streptococcal GN is that the organism is found typically in the nasopharynx or the skin. In the UK, it's seen, seen much more frequently in the nasopharynx. In Africa, 
the organisms found most commonly in the skin, but if you have skin carriage, then we see that in younger individuals and they have a higher attack rate. Let's just think about the typical clinical features of a post-streptococcal GM. Typically, the child experiences a sore throat around 10 days before the onset of mild periorbital edema. And if left, that mild edema becomes more generalised. Between a third and a half of them will then go on to develop the typical smoky, coke or tea-coloured burgundy urine of macroscopic hematuria and they'll become oliguric. The children are often febrile, they have malaise, headaches and generalised weakness. So on examination, these children are inevitably hypertensive, which reflects circulatory overload, and around 5% of them are frankly encephalopathic. They have edema, pallor, and features of circulatory overload, such as a raised JVP, etc. So let's consider the laboratory findings. If we look in the urine, as I said, an active urine with red cells, white cells, red cell casts, and mild proteinuria. The biochemistry is often normal, although some individuals will have, as we noted from the question, an elevated potassium, and some of them will have an elevated creatinine. Hematologically, the pallor that you see relates to a dilutional normochromic normocytic anemia. The white cell count is sometimes high. Bacteriologically, we can find evidence of infection from a positive throat or skin swab. Some patients have a high ASOT, an anti-streptolysin oteta, and if the ASOT is equivocal or negative, you can look further using anti-hyaluronidase or anti-DNAs B. Immunologically, these children almost inevitably have a low C3 at presentation and a normal C4. And what we do see is that the C3 comes up after about six weeks, and we'll look at that in a little more detail shortly. The management of these children is largely supportive. The appropriate physiological treatment for their hypertension that relates to fluid overload is by giving them a diuretic to offset the fluid and cause them to void more, and this is a very useful drug. However, in children who have very severe hypertension, then clearly you wouldn't use frusamide alone, and you'd use other more fast-acting, more powerful antihypertensives as well. So the edema is often mild and responds well to fluid restriction and diuretics, Regarding the infection, antibiotics are only useful to eradicate the spread of the streptococcus between individuals. They don't attenuate the course of the disease in the affected individual at all. Very rarely, patients with a post-streptococcal GN will develop acute renal failure, and this would be treated in the standard way by dialysis, etc. Let's look at the course of the disease. The creatinine, if abnormal, is usually normal by a fortnight, and if there is hypertension, this is usually resolved by three weeks. Any macroscopic hematuria is similarly better by three weeks. And as I alluded to earlier, the C3 becomes normal by six weeks. The proteinuria, however, can go on for a long time and takes up to six months to resolve. And after the macroscopic hematuria is gone, the microscopic hematuria can last for up to 12 months. So these things really may drag on. The important thing about the course of the disease is that we don't see disease recurrence in post-streptococcal GN. If you're presented with somebody who looks like they've got recurrent post-streptococcal GN, they won't have this. They'll have another form of glomerulonephritis that we'll talk about in due course. The prognosis for post-streptococcal GN is very good, with more than 90% of them making a full recovery, and only between a half and 2% of them go on to end-stage renal failure. And as I'm sure you're aware, end-stage renal failure is defined as the immediate need for dialysis or transplantation, which equates to a GFR of around 15 mils per minute per 1.73 metres squared. Let's move on now to the second question which is a 13-year-old girl presents with red spots on her buttocks and legs. She has joint pains, hypertension and proteinuria. She had an upper respiratory tract infection two to three weeks ago. This is a best of five, so what's the most likely diagnosis? Is it A, proliferative glomerulonephritis, B, good pasture syndrome, C, vaginous granulomatosis, D, henox schoenlein purpura, or E, systemic lupus erythematosus? The answer is Henox-Schoenlein purpura. 
So we've got a 13-year-old girl here, and the key things are the red spots on her buttocks and legs, which is describing the typical rash of HSP. She has joint pains, which we see in HSP, and she has hypertension and proteinuria, both of which are features of HSP. She also has had an upper respiratory tract infection, which is a common antecedent to that condition. She's unlikely to have a proliferative glomerulonephritis because of the rash and the joint pains. She's unlikely to have good pasture syndrome because there's no mention of lung involvement and inevitably in the exam there will be. She's unlikely to have vaganas because the rash isn't typical and there will be other features of that disorder that should be in the question for you to make that diagnosis. And I guess coming a close second would be SLE, but again it's the distribution of her spots that would put you off lupus and put you onto the track of HSP. So let's talk a little bit about HSP. As I'm sure you know, this is the commonest childhood vasculitis and is caused by polymeric IgA immune complexes which are deposited primarily in the skin, gut and the glomerular capillaries. The incidence of nephritis is between 10 and 60%, and this depends very much on how you make the definition. If you were to define nephritis as mild proteinuria, then the figure is going to be greater to 60%, and if you're going to define nephritis as heavy proteinuria and some elevation of creatinine, then it's going to be nearer to 10%. The peak incidence of HSP is at around five years of age, and it's usually of sudden onset and preceded by an upper respiratory tract infection in about a third of cases. The rash, which typically occurs on the extensor surfaces of the arms and the legs and on the buttocks, begins as tiny urticarial lesions, which subsequently become purpuric. The rash can crop and may develop over many weeks or even months. And the significant thing about the rash is that there isn't any relation to the disease prognosis. We see individuals with a very severe rash who have minimal renal involvement and also individuals who have virtually no rash who have quite a bad nephritis. The other thing that we get in HSP is a transient weight-bearing large joint arthralgia which is present in almost three quarters of individuals and there's some gut involvement typically with pain in between a half and three quarters and interestingly if you've got renal involvement then around 90 percent of individuals are going to have simultaneous gut involvement also. If we look at the prognosis of HSP then this is generally good. This slide illustrates the five different types of clinical presentation and their risk of developing end-stage renal failure. In HSP, most of the patients, the vast majority of the patients, are in group 1, so they present with microscopic or maybe macroscopic hematuria with minimal proteinuria, and we can see that their risk of developing end-stage is between 0 and 5%, and their prognosis is therefore very good. Quite often individuals will get proteinuria at the onset of the disease, but we tend to be more interested in proteinuria that's persistent. So if you've still got moderate or heavy proteinuria after two to three weeks of the onset of the illness, then you'd be very much considered as a candidate for a biopsy rather than biopsying those individuals right at the beginning of their acute illness. Few patients are in groups 2 to 5, but groups 2 to 5 do illustrate some interesting and important underlying paediatric nephrology principles. The first one is that in general terms, if you have proteinuria, which is heavy, you will do worse than if you have no proteinuria. And that's true pretty much independent of whichever nephritis you're talking about. And the other interesting point is that if you have a mixed nephritic, nephrotic presentation of a nephritis, then you're going to do badly. You can see for HSP, the risk of end stage exceeds 50% if you present in that way, and that's true for other nephritides. So if at any time you get an individual who presents with a mixed picture of nephritis and nephrotic syndrome, then they're going to do badly, irrespective of their underlying histology. So... Which children with henox schoenlein purpura are going to require a biopsy? Well, it's generally only required if the proteinuria is moderate to heavy and persistent, and as I say, usually after two to three weeks of presentation. Biopsy is important, however, because the histological grade determines which treatment children require. Obviously, as many children with HSP don't get biopsied, they don't need treatment. But if treatment is necessary, then cyclophosphamide and prednisolone is often used. And after an 8- or 12-week course of those agents, perhaps a year of azathioprine and alternate-day prednisolone is necessary. 
the morbidity and mortality of HSP relates almost exclusively to the renal disease. So we don't get any long-term sequelae of the gut involvement, of the joint involvement, or of the rash. It's all down to the kidneys. Let's move on to another question. Question three. A nine-year-old boy presents to his GP having noticed a bloody discoloration of his urine over the past couple of days. He has also suffered recently a chorizal illness. Urine testing confirms hematuria and proteinuria. And on two previous occasions after respiratory tract infections, he was noted to have macroscopic hematuria. What underlying diagnosis best fits this clinical picture? This is a best of five. And the responses are A, Hartnup's disease, B, renal calculi, C, minimal change nephrotic syndrome, D, IgA disease, or E, membranous nephropathy? The answer is going to be D, IgA disease. IgA disease is typified by recurrent, often painless, macroscopic hematuria precipitated by upper respiratory tract infections. And this lad presents with a classical history of IgA disease. If we look through the other options, he's very unlikely to have Hartnup's disease. This is a recessive disorder of a leak of neutral amino acids that doesn't present with hematuria and simply presents with failure to thrive and developmental problems. B, could he have renal calculi? It would be unusual in that he's got proteinuria that you don't normally see with calculi, and nobody mentions the fact that he's had pain or passed any grit stones or debris. So I think that that's unlikely. Does he have minimal change nephrotic syndrome? Again, very unlikely because of the recurrent macroscopic hematuria. Does he have membranous nephropathy, which is option E? I think that that's a remote possibility. Membranous is a very uncommon disorder and can present with a nephritic picture, but doesn't tend to present at this sort of age, largely presenting in the second decade. So of those options, IgA disease is the most likely underlying clinical diagnosis. That leads us on nicely to talk about IgA disease. This is quite a common glomerulonephritis and one that you may see in clinical practice. The onset of the condition is between 5 and 10 years, and boys are affected twice as often as girls. Occasionally, there's a family history. Classic features are one of macroscopic hematuria with upper respiratory tract infections, and occasionally there's pain associated with a macroscopic hematuria. It's a recurrent disease, and every time you experience an upper respiratory tract infection, there's usually a degree of blood in the urine. And the interval between upper respiratory tract infection and bleeding is very short, the matter of a few hours, which contrasts to post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, where there are many days. In IgA disease, a high serum IgA is seen in about a fifth of patients. In between bouts of macroscopic hematuria, then the urine is either clear or contains small amounts of microscopic blood. There's no proteinuria usually. Complement levels are normal, as is the blood pressure. And the prognosis for this condition, largely relating to the fact that most individuals have no proteinuria, is extremely good. However, a small number do go on to end-stage renal failure. And if treatment is required, and it generally isn't, then fish oil and or steroids have been shown to be efficacious. Let's move on to another question. Question four. Membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis, which is synonymous with mesangiocapillary glomerulonephritis, typically has the following characteristics. A, renal tubular acidosis. B, low levels of C3. C, highly selective proteinuria. D, 50% progress to end-stage renal failure within two years. And E, presents as an acute nephritis. So this is a true-false question. Let's have a look at the answers. Membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis doesn't typically have renal tubular acidosis. Acidosis isn't a feature of the disease in the early stages commonly. Does it have low levels of C3? Yes, it does, and we'll talk about complement abnormalities in due course. Do we have highly selective proteinuria? We don't. That's said to be a classical feature of minimal change nephrotic syndrome and not membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. Do 50% progress to end-stage renal failure within two years? That's not true. A significant number do progress to end-stage renal failure, but normally not that quickly. Does it present as an acute nephritis? It indeed does, and its typical presentation is as an acute nephritic illness, so that's true. 
Let's move on to talk about membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis, which I'll refer to as MPGN from now. MPGN is rare. It's a disease of older children and is typically seen in the second decade. It often presents as a nephritis, a so-called recurrent post-streptococcal GN. This is the disease that mimics post-streptococcal GN. It presents as a nephrosis on occasions and accounts for 5% of all childhood nephrotics. It sometimes presents simply with hypertension and sometimes with renal failure. There are two main types, type 1 and type 2, and the subtleties of these conditions are really beyond the scope of the exam, but you do need to know the complement abnormalities associated with the two types. In MPGN1, the C3 is low and the C4 is low as well, and in MPGN2, the C3 is low, but the C4 is normal. So it's MPGN2 that mimics post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, but the difference is that in post-strep, the C3 returns to normal after six weeks, but in MPG and two, the C3 remains low throughout the course of the disease. Treatment of MPGN is difficult. The best evidence suggests that high-dose steroids over a protracted period can be helpful. But the prognosis is poor, with 15 to 40 percent progressing to end stage after 10 years. Let's move on to talk about another glomerulonephritis, that's focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. And like MPGN, this is primarily a disease of older children seen in the second decade. It presents typically a steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome. So if you have a nephrotic who hasn't responded to a month of high-dose steroids, then the likely diagnosis is going to be FSGS. In FSGS, the complement is normal, and the treatment of FSGS is of one of a number of agents. Cyclosporin is generally efficacious, as is cyclophosphamide. And in some instances, tacrolimus and MMF, mycophenolate mofetil, have been tried. The prognosis for FSGS is reasonable, not as bad as MPGN, but still fairly poor, with a third of them progressing over many years to end-stage renal failure, a third of them having heavy ongoing proteinuria, but a third of them do reasonably well with moderate proteinuria only. Just to finish off looking at the nephritides, let's just review the complement abnormalities. The good news is that Other than these listed on this slide, all the other glomerulonephritides have normal complement, and we've only got two patterns of complement abnormality to fix in our mind, and thankfully, all we have to think about is the C3 and C4. So the two patterns are, as illustrated in the upper portion of the slide, a low C3 and a normal C4 that we see in post-streptococcal GN and MPGN2, and then in lupus and MPGN1, you see a low C3 and a low C4. And also, in overwhelming sepsis, you can see a low C3 and a low C4. So if you can keep those in mind, and remember that in all the other glomerulonephritides, the complement's normal, then you can generally tackle most questions that talk about complement abnormalities in glomerulonephritis. Let's move on to another question, just really to go through and revise what we've been talking about to this point. Question five. This is an extended matching question, And the options are A, IgA disease, B, membranous glomerulonephritis, C, post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, D, Henoch-Schoenlein nephritis, and E, membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. F is good pasture syndrome, G is systemic lupus erythematosus, H, shunt nephritis, I, Allport syndrome, and J, polyarthritis nodosa. For each question below, choose the single most likely cause from the options above. Each option can be used more than once. So question one is a five-year-old boy who presents with mild edema, hypertension, and a slightly elevated plasma creatinine, and a low plasma C3. Question two, 12 weeks after his initial presentation, the same boy in question one still has mild edema and a low plasma C3. Question three is a four-year-old girl with joint pain, a rash, and mild proteinuria. And question four is a 12-year-old boy who presents with proteinuria and a family history of deafness. So let's review the results. Question one, this is a boy with a typical history of post-streptococcal GN. And to ensure that we remember the classic catch, question two, the same boy, his C3 remains low, so it therefore gives him the diagnosis of membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis type 2, and so the option there is E, membranoproliferative GN. 
Question three is a four-year-old girl with joint pains, a rash and mild proteinuria, and of those options, the most likely one is HSP. And finally, question four is a 12-year-old boy who presents with proteinuria and a family history of deafness. And the key thing here is the family history of deafness. And that pretty much makes the diagnosis of all port syndrome, which is a familial, typically X-linked recessive nephritis associated with sensory neural deafness and anterior lenticonus. So the diagnosis in question four, all port syndrome. Let's move away from the nephritides now and think about nephrosis, which is a term synonymous with nephrotic syndrome. So let's do question six. A five-year-old boy was diagnosed with minimal change nephrotic syndrome. Which of the following are true regarding his condition? A, it usually presents with generalised edema. B, it commonly improves with steroid treatment. C, it often results in chronic renal failure in adulthood. D, it's generally associated with macroscopic hematuria. And E, it's often complicated by encephalopathy. So let's have a look at the answers of this true-false question. Nephrotic syndrome, minimal change nephrotic syndrome, typically does present with generalised edema, and it also does commonly improve with steroid treatment, and we'll talk a bit more about minimal change in a moment. It doesn't often result in chronic renal failure in adulthood, and most cases burn themselves out in adolescence. And it isn't generally associated with macroscopic hematuria. In fact, macroscopic hematuria would be one of those features that would make you think that it wasn't minimal change and it was a more atypical nephrotic syndrome. It isn't often complicated by encephalopathy. There's no CNS involvement and there's very mild hypertension, if any. In fact, most kids, as we'll see, with minimal change are underfilled and are hypotensive. Let's think about another question, question seven. A three-year-old boy complains of nausea and fatigue, and on examination, he has marked periorbital edema and mild pitting edema of his ankles. His blood pressure is 100 over 70 millimetres of mercury. Blood urea and serum creatinine levels are normal. An early morning urinary protein to creatinine ratio is 965 milligrams per millimole. So of this best of five, which is the most likely diagnosis? Well, clearly the most likely answer is minimal change nephrotic syndrome. This is a young boy who's got significant edema, he's normotensive, and significantly he has a strikingly elevated urinary protein to creatinine ratio. The normal level would be less than 20, and this is really very high and well into the nephrotic range. So the most likely diagnosis is going to be minimal change. Does he have A, angioneurotic edema? Well, no, because he's got raging proteinuria. Does he have focal segmental glomerular sclerosis? It's a possibility, but we'd only know that really having given him a trial of steroids. There's no features to suggest that in the history, and he's a bit young to have FSGS. Does he have acute tubular necrosis? Probably not. His urea and creatinine are normal, and the proteinuria, if any, that you get in acute tubular necrosis is often mild. Does he have an acute interstitial nephritis? Probably not. Again, in acute interstitial nephritis, often there's impairment of renal function, and the proteinuria that you see is very mild, and there's usually exposure to a drug, which isn't in this question. So he's far more likely to have minimal change disease than anything else. One last question. Question 8. The following are commonly seen in childhood nephrotic syndrome. A, hypertension. B, spontaneous resolution in late childhood. C, peritonitis. D, anemia. And E, pulmonary edema. True, false question. Let's have a look at the answers. Hypertension isn't commonly seen. We'll see that usually the blood pressure is normal or a little bit low. Spontaneous resolution, as we've already said, is often seen, so that's true. Peritonitis is a complicating feature of nephrotic syndrome, but it's certainly not commonly seen. Anemia isn't usually a feature of childhood nephrotic syndrome. And although pulmonary edema can be sometimes seen, particularly if you give albumin too quickly, it's not really commonly seen and is a rare and unfortunate complication. So of those five, only B, spontaneous resolution in late childhood, is true. So let's move on and think about the nephrotic syndrome. Let's just look at the definition of the nephrotic syndrome. Now, the 
Nephrotic syndrome is defined as heavy proteinuria. And most authorities would say that nephrotic range proteinuria was a urinary protein to creatinine ratio of greater than 250 milligrams per millimole. And as we saw in the previous question, most nephrotics run protein creatinine ratios far in excess of that. That degree of proteinuria equates to a daily protein loss of about 40 milligrams per meter squared. As a consequence of the proteinuria, we have hypoalbuminemia, and the plasma albumin is usually less than 25 grams per litre, and you also experience edema, and also, if chronic, hyperlipidemia. The incidence of childhood nephrotic syndrome is about 1 in 6,000 children each year. So if we now think about the classification of nephrotic syndrome, there are a number of classifications, and a fairly standard one is shown at the top of the slide. That differentiates nephrotic syndrome into primary glomerular disease and into multi-system disease. If you can see under primary glomerular disease, the vast majority of children who have nephrotic syndrome are going to have minimal change disease. Very few are going to have the other potential causes, such as FSGS, MPGN, and membranous nephropathy. If you have multi-system disease, you can have nephrotic syndrome as a consequence of HSP and of lupus and of many other conditions. This classification is useful, but an alternative classification is much more straightforward. That is, that irrespective of your underlying histology, if you have steroid-sensitive disease, your prognosis is good. And conversely, if you have steroid-resistant disease, again, irrespective of what the pathology is, your prognosis is much poorer. And in practical terms, the second classification is much more useful. Like we did with nephritis, let's think about the basic principles that underlie nephrotic syndrome, nephrosis. The key thing in nephrotic syndrome is this loss of albumin in the urine. Now, albumin in the blood generates the plasma oncotic pressure. So as the blood albumin falls, as the albumin enters the urine and then goes down the toilet, the oncotic pressure falls and the fluid that's within the vasculature leaks out into the tissues and you end up with massive edema which contrasts to the mild edema that you see in nephritic syndrome. In nephrotic syndrome, the proteinuria that you see is vast, very, very heavy proteinuria, and the urine is otherwise quiet. There are no other elements in it, typically, just lots and lots of protein. So we end up with a patient who's got massive edema, who's underfilled, and who's hypovolemic, who's crying out for fluid and is usually hypotensive. So the cartoon nephrotic is one of an underfilled, massively edematous, hugely proteinuric, hypotensive individual. And that contrasts with the cartoon nephrotic that we talked about before, who is stuffed full of fluid, who can't void it out, who has fluid overload, who's hypertensive, who has an elevated JVP, who has a little bit of hydrostatic edema, who has a little bit of proteinuria. So those are the cartoon differences between nephrosis and nephrotic syndrome. And I use the word cartoon because obviously in reality the extremes are not going to be as polarised as I describe them. But for the basic rationale of understanding the differences between them, then I think that these cartoon pictures are valid. So let's just talk a little bit now about typical minimal change. The age at presentation is generally between 1 and 10 years. If you present before one year, the chances are that you're going to have finished type congenital nephrotic syndrome, which is a very different disease. And if you present over the age of 10 years, you're going to have one of the other glomerular nephritides, such as FSGS and MPGN, which are typically disorders of older children. Once again, we see minimal chains change in boys twice as often as we do in girls and it's a disease of rapid onset so from being fairly well to presenting to hospital with gross edema is generally less than four weeks and in many cases is just a few days. Typical minimal change disease, the commonest form of nephrotic syndrome in childhood, doesn't have macroscopic hematuria. A small number of individuals will have microscopic hematuria but no macroscopic hematuria. And with typical minimal change disease, the blood pressure is normal, as is the creatinine. What 
causes minimal change disease. This isn't terribly well understood, but there's felt to be an immunological basis to a loss of the glomerular basement membrane's negative charge. So what would happen in health is that the GBM, the glomerular basement membrane, which is negatively charged, repels the albumin molecules, which are similarly negatively charged. But something happens to the heparan sulfate portion of the glomerular basement membrane in minimal change disease it loses its negative charge and the albumin molecules are able to pass very readily through the glomerular basement membrane and spill in vast quantities into the urine. What are the symptoms and signs of minimal change disease? Well, they present with a periorbital edema and I've put no itch in brackets here because quite often people feel that there's an allergic ocular reaction that is uh, the cause of the problem and the old joke is that the commonest prescribed drug in nephrotic syndrome is pyriton. If you leave them untreated then they'll develop generalised edema sometimes with ascites, sometimes with pleural effusions and their blood pressure, although in the cartoon we described it as being low and it is typically on the low side, can be either up or down the nephrotics can have this phenomenon of paradoxical hypertension where, when you're strikingly underfilled, the underperfused kidney generates vast quantities of renin and aldosterone to drive the blood pressure up. So you have that clinical circumstance where you've got somebody who's hypertensive who, funnily enough, needs volume, and if you give them volume, they perfuse their kidneys and their blood pressure falls. They often have abdominal pain, and abdominal pain must be taken seriously in nephrotic syndrome. It's typically due to splanchnic underperfusion, and that clearly needs to be treated with volume, but it can relate to pancreatitis, to peritonitis, to dyspepsia related to steroids, and to thrombus within the abdomen. So all of those things need treating, and abdominal pain in nephrotic syndrome must be taken seriously. Sometimes nephrotic children are miserable also. Let's have a look at the results that you see. The urine, as we've said already, sometimes you see microscopic hematuria, but generally you don't. The urinary sodium is very useful in determining whether somebody needs volume. If the urinary sodium is less than about 10 millimoles per litre, this is good evidence that the child is avidly hanging on to salt and water and has evidence of a reduced circulating volume. And sometimes with nephrotics, it's difficult to make a clinical diagnosis of somebody being underfilled, so the urinary sodium is very helpful. If we look at the plasma biochemistry, the urea and creatinine are usually normal, but the creatinine can be elevated if you're really dry. The plasma calcium is usually normal also. Lipids in chronic disease have the following pattern. We see cholesterol, LDL and VLDL elevated, but HDL is down. So let's now think about the complications of nephrotic syndrome. Hypovolemia is the thing that we see most commonly. And that also relates to a certain extent to the second complication on this list, which is thrombosis. And kids with nephrotic syndrome will clot. You need to keep a very close eye on them. There's a list here of the factors that predispose them to clotting, and they can clot. They can have a saddle thrombus over their aortic bifurcation. They can have a cavernous sinus thrombus. They can get clots in their legs, in their lungs, and you must watch them like hawks. Hyperlipidemia, as we've mentioned previously, is sometimes seen. And kids with nephrotic syndrome are very susceptible to pneumococcal infection. It's specifically pneumococcal infection because of the pattern of immunoglobulin loss in their urine and the fact that they have abnormal complement activation and generally they're immunosuppressed. And you can vaccinate these children with a polyvalent anti-pneumococcal vaccine, Pneumovax, or some authorities would give them prophylactic penicillin when they're edematous. Acute renal failure is sometimes seen in nephrotics, and that's largely if you've been left significantly hypovolemic for a long period of time. And we mustn't forget the side effects of drug treatment, which are really quite unpleasant in this disease. Let's just consider some terms in the nephrotic syndrome. We know that the nephrotic syndrome is a relapsing and remitting disease and will do so for many years often. So a relapse is defined as urine protein excretion of three pluses on dipstick testing for three or more consecutive days. An alternative definition is one of two pluses on dipstick testing for five consecutive days. A response is defined as zero or trace from three consecutive days. 
And somebody who's defined as having frequent relapses has two or more relapses within six months of their initial response or four or more within a 12-month period. Steroid resistance, which is important in FSGS and MPGN, is failure to achieve response despite four weeks of high-dose oral steroids. The treatment of nephrotic syndrome is largely with prednisolone, and, and for many individuals, steroids can be used to get the patient fairly rapidly into remission. When you have relapsed, albumin, penicillin, ranitidine, and a low-salt diet to reduce fluid intake are often employed, But generally, when you have frequently relapsing disease, we may need to move on to another agent if lower-dose alternate-day steroids doesn't help. And levamisole is sometimes used, as is cyclosporin A, cyclophosphamide, tacrolimus, or mycophenolate mofetil. But we must never forget that the greatest morbidity associated with this disease relates to the treatment rather than to the underlying nephrotic syndrome. The prognosis in nephrotic syndrome is generally very good, 20% of individuals will only have one relapse. 30% will have an occasional relapse, which is somewhere between one relapse and the definition of frequent relapses. And 50% of individuals will be frequent relapses. What we see is only a small proportion of individuals continuing into adulthood. As I mentioned earlier, this disease does tend to spontaneously remit in adolescence, and so we only see a small proportion going on into adulthood. And of that number, only a small proportion will subsequently go on to end-stage renal failure. And the final point is that death in nephrotic syndrome nowadays is very uncommon and usually preventable. Let's finally review the key learning points. The clinical features of nephritis relate to oliguria and fluid overload. Secondly, complement abnormalities in the glomerulonephritides we've seen are fairly straightforward. Nephrotic syndrome's clinical features relate to a low plasma oncotic pressure resulting in hypovolemia. And finally, childhood nephrosis has a good prognosis. Thank you.